In 2047, when the Skrin first invaded Earth during the Third Tiberium War, both the Global Defense Initiative and Brotherhood of Nod initially struggled against the advanced technology and firepower of the alien invaders. From infantry units that could instantly teleport from one location to another, to large tripods that could crush almost any vehicle beneath their legs, while simultaneously firing their proton beams in all directions, the Skrin proved to be a formidable force. By far the most advanced weapon systems in the Skrin arsenal were their aircraft, or more accurately, spacecraft, since many of them seemed capable of operating within the Earth's orbit and beyond. This gives the Skrin craft an advantage over those used by GDI, who make a distinction between aircraft that operate in the Earth's stratosphere and spacecraft that operate in the Earth's thermosphere. While GDI have craft capable of operating within all atmospheres of the Earth, such as the Kodiak and Dropship, these vehicles were largely retired shortly after the Second Tiberium War, allowing the Skrin to have near total air superiority during the early days of their invasion. Another advantage the Skrin craft had over those used by humans was that they did not need jet fuel to power them. Instead, they relied on Tiberium, or at least the radiation that Tiberium emits allowing their craft to loiter over a location for an indefinite period of time. The first and most important of these craft was the drone ship. The drone ships were the first Skrin vehicles deployed to the surface of the Earth by Foreman 371. The individual drone ships were initially attached together to form six large space vessels, ones that had spent an unknown amount of time in interstellar travel to the solar system and in stasis in the Kuiper Belt beyond the planet Neptune. The six vessels were split apart thanks to GDI's attempt to destroy them with the Ion Cannon, causing 39 individual drone ships to land in the Tiberium-infested red zones of Earth. The drone ship acted as the mobile construction vehicle, MCV, for the Skrin. When deployed, it is known as the Drone Platform. Using nano-assemblers, the drone platform could construct any buildings or structures the Skrin needed for Tiberium harvesting and military operations in the area. Due to its importance, the structure was built from materials that made it difficult to destroy, unless an immense amount of firepower was concentrated on it. Just like the MCVs of GDI and the Brotherhood, the drone could move itself to a new location. However, instead of traveling on the ground like the human MCVs, it could fly at a low level, allowing it to cross chasms and gain access to areas normally inaccessible to human MCVs. The ship was also slow and vulnerable while in flight, unable to defend or repair itself should it be attacked by enemy aircraft or other anti-air weapon systems. The drone ship had a large spike on the bottom. Once it found a suitable location to land, it maneuvered straight downward, the spike puncturing deep into the ground to keep the ship stable as it converted itself to a platform. Once the conversion was complete, the Skrin foreman could go about establishing a new base at the location. Shortly after constructing extractors to harvest Tiberium, the foreman would then want to construct military buildings to protect harvesting operations and clear any hostile human forces in the area. In order to establish air superiority, the foreman would first need to construct a gravity stabilizer. Initially, when information about the Skrin was limited, the Brotherhood of Nod classified this structure as a Visitor Type 8 structure. In order to gather more information regarding this building, the Brotherhood sent a shadow team into Skrin controlled territory to observe the structure and ascertain its function. Quoting a field report from the Intelligence Database, Intel Section 93 Report. Shadow Team Alpha-22 deployed to enemy theater of operations in Area 11, Vanguard Sector, coordinates Gulf 9 Kilo 5. Mission, collect radiological and full spectrum data on visitor structure type 8, with intent to discern primary functional capability. Arrived 0200 hours undetected, 320 meters from target. Deployed receptors and gathered data for around 19 hours before Seeker Patrol ambushed team. Six of eight team members eliminated in escape. One subsequently died of injuries sustained during extraction. Initial analysis of gathered data shows that Type 8 structure acts as a gravity stabilizer to compensate for intense gravity fields generated by planetary bodies. 
This evidently allows alien spacecraft to make short-range teleportation jumps into Earth's magnetic and gravitic field with maximum precision. Gravity stabilizers typically appear only in well-secured areas, where alien operations are highly focused. Visitor craft observed using the gravity stabilizer include the units designated as Storm Rider, Planetary Assault Carrier, and Devastator Warship. These craft appear to be entering the area of operations using the gravity stabilizer before heading to objectives in the surrounding regions. Recommendation: Prioritize destruction of gravity stabilizer structures in combat zones. In neutral zones, disable via reactor sabotage in order to delay deployment of major enemy combat units. Note, structure type 8, now designated as Gravity Stabilizer. Not only did the Gravity Stabilizer teleport in Skrin aircraft, including a drone ship, it could also repair them, using small hover drones whose tentacles acted as repair tools. The Stabilizer had four pads, which could support one Storm Rider. Additional Storm Riders would require more Gravity Stabilizers to dock them on additional pads. The Storm Rider itself was the basic multi-purpose aircraft for the Skrin. These flying wing aircraft, resembling manta rays, were the first encountered as they emerged from the Skrin-occupied red zones. This fast-moving aircraft was armed with twin plasma autocannons, which could be used against both ground and air targets. A group of four Storm Riders are quite effective at destroying harvesters, and even some buildings if they focus their fire on them. Unlike their Banshee or Orca counterparts, the Storm Riders constantly maneuver around their engaged targets in order to make themselves harder to hit by anti-air weapon systems, such as the Nod SAM turrets or GDI's AA batteries. Storm Riders also played a pivotal role in protecting the Skrin's other larger and more powerful aircraft, the first of which was the Devastator warship. The design of the craft seems to resemble that of a stag beetle, due to the large pincers at the front of it. Like many of the Skrin units, it's difficult to tell whether this craft is a vehicle or an entire creature itself. Between the pincers is the warship's weapon, classified as a Zeus Plasma Disc battery. The system launches plasma discs over a long range at any and all ground targets below the warship. This effectively makes this craft the Skrin's primary artillery platform, one that was highly effective at laying siege to enemy bases. These ships were attributed to causing the most destruction of the Earth's Blue Zones during the initial stages of the invasion, thus earning their Devastator name. As devastating as these warships could be, they did have weaknesses that could be exploited. Although highly effective against ground targets, they were incapable of using their weapon system against aircraft, making them extremely vulnerable to quick aerial strikes from GDI's Firehawks or Nod's Banshees. The ships were also slow moving and had a wide turning radius, and therefore incapable of escaping from bad situations quickly. To mediate these weaknesses, the Skrin would outfit their warships with force field generators, which they developed at a cross-shaped structure called the Technology Assembler. The structure itself was required to be built before the Skrin foremen could warp in the warships. The generators would be assembled at this structure, and then equipped onto the warship. These generators emitted a force field around the ship, which would absorb all incoming damage for as long as the field remained active. Only so much damage could be absorbed until the generator was unable to sustain the field, bringing it down and leaving the ship vulnerable to incoming fire. The force field could even absorb a single EMP blast, but would be knocked down in the exchange. After a couple of minutes, the force field would return, protecting the warship. The sect of the Skrin known as Traveler 59 did not make use of such force fields. Instead, they opted to equip their warships with specially designed Traveler engines from their own technology assembler. These engines boosted the speed of their warships, allowing them to either reach an enemy base faster in order to lay siege to it, or make a hastier retreat if the need arose. The Skrin had a larger and more powerful ship to engage the human forces of Earth. This ship was called the Planetary Assault Carrier, or PAC, PAC for short. Just like the Devastator warship, the pack's design resembled that of an insect, especially with the front or head of the vehicle, assuming it is a vehicle to begin with, and not some kind of living creature. 
As its name implies, this spacecraft's role was spearheading assaults on a hostile planet. The word carrier comes from the fact that the ship carries eight invader fighters on each side. These small but agile drone fighters would all deploy at the same time and swarm any ground or air target. The fighters were each equipped with a single beam weapon, which, when all focused against a single target, would quickly destroy it, no matter if that target be a vehicle, structure, or infantry unit. Just a couple of packs, with a total of 16 fighters, could devastate an enemy force or base that lacked sufficient anti-air weaponry. The packs were also capable of detecting stealth units in their vicinity. While agile, the PAX fighters were lightly armored, and could be shot down quite easily with enough anti-air fire. Any fighters that were shot down would eventually be replaced with new ones back at the carrier. The pack itself could be targeted and destroyed. Upon its destruction, all of the carrier's fighters, whether docked or deployed, would self-destruct. If all of a pack's fighters were destroyed, the ship itself would be almost defenseless. I say almost, because the pack had the unique capability of generating an ion storm in its immediate area. Normally, ion storms are formed naturally in the Tiberium-infested red zones. Nevertheless, some of the Skrin's vehicles, like the pack, or structures, like the storm column, were able to generate these storms in their immediate vicinity. Bolts of lightning shoot out of these storms, which can cause damage to nearby human ground or air units. If any Skrin craft were loitering within the storms, they received a boost in their combat effectiveness. This included increasing the damage they inflict on hostile forces, reducing the amount of damage they take from said hostiles, and allowing the craft to repair or heal itself, similar to how Skrin infantry units can heal themselves in the middle of a Tiberium field. However, the pack can only maintain its own storm so long as it is hovering in the same location. Once it starts moving in any direction, the storm dissipates, removing the advantages it provided to the carrier, and any other aircraft within it. Just like the Devastator warships, the planetary assault carriers could be upgraded with force field generators. In addition, those packs that were part of the Traveler 59 sect would make use of Traveler engines, in order to move faster. These engines were quite useful on them, as the packs were even slower moving than the warships. A Skrin foreman could not just warp in a pack from a gravity stabilizer without first constructing a signal transmitter. This caterpillar-shaped structure was also responsible for calling in the most powerful craft in the Skrin arsenal, the Mothership. The Mothership was a rarely seen but powerful weapon in the Skrin arsenal. Unlike the planetary assault carrier, which made use of small fighter drones as its weapons, the colossal wheel-shaped mothership was a weapon in and of itself. It was basically a massive flying beam cannon. When called in, the mothership begins to slowly move towards its target. While the mothership was one of the Skrin's most well-armored craft, it could still be destroyed with enough concentrated fire. So the Skrin would sometimes provide it with an escort of their other air and ground forces. Once the mothership reaches its destination, it positions itself just above the designated target. Using its catalyst cannon, the mothership fires a jolt of energy down on the target, instantly destroying it. However, this initial blast causes a chain reaction, which destroys all other units and structures caught in the chain. This devastating attack can level entire cities in a single blast, making it more than capable of destroying a whole GDI or Nod base. In addition to being the most powerful weapon in the Skrin arsenal, a mothership could act as a flying command and control center for a Skrin foreman. Foreman 371, the Skrin commander responsible for overseeing the invasion of Earth, made its escape from the planet by flying its mothership through one of the recently constructed Threshold Towers transporting the foreman back to i Hub, the presumed homeworld of the Skrin. Congratulations, foreman. Mission salvaged. Mothership saved. Other notable events involving the Mothership was the fall of the city of Bern in Switzerland. The city was part of the new Eden Blue Zone, one of the first zones targeted by the Skrin at the start of their invasion. An eyewitness account from a civilian engineering corps foreman, Martin Hofsummer, describes the city's destruction. 
I was about to go off the clock when the evacuate order came through. Klaxons, sirens, broadcast on every channel. Even the damn billboards and street signs were telling us to get out of town. I called my wife, or tried, but every network was jammed. Jammed or just static. We lived in the central district, worker family housing. I had been supervising the final touches on my chunk of the anti-tip wall, out on the east side, half a city away. Within 10 minutes, I had abandoned my car and started to run. The vehicle exit points had jammed up less than 10 minutes after the first alert, plunging the city into gridlock. Seconds later, I was sprinting past Holovision kiosks, and the ones that were still broadcasting, all I could see was destruction, death, fire. So I'm running, and I start to hear this low hum. At first I think it's just the static from the public address system, gone dead a few minutes earlier. It isn't. It's something more, like a machine but alive, also, somehow. It starts to grow, the sound larger and larger as I sprint, and the sky is now dark, and the city walls are falling. The city walls I helped build. And there are things, things in the sky, glowing, blue and glossy, machines but alive. I keep running, my lungs burn, my sides ache, but I'm getting close to the city. There's a thing in the sky, like the others, but huge, noise deafening, a massive ring, rotating around a central object some kind of control pod. I am too close to take it all in, to know how it works. It's nearly over me, over central burn. And now it is glowing, drawing up some kind of energy. I lower my head and run. For a second, everything is silent, as if the gigantic thing had sucked the sound right out of the air. Then light, everywhere, all consuming. I fall, shielding my eyes. Light, light and silence. When I come to, there, there is no central burn, no worker family housing, all gone. Just a pit, gouged from the earth, a pit where a city used to be. At the center, there is something blue, blue and glittering. After the destruction of the city center, the Skrin established a few bases around the site of the crater. This site acted as their primary staging area for all attacks in Northern Europe. When GDI forces arrived to destroy these bases, the Skren called in a mothership to wipe out the GDI force, most likely the same one that was responsible for the destruction of Central Burn. The GDI commander was well prepared though, and brought the mothership down before it could reach his forward base. During Legion's attempt to capture the Tacitus from a GDI convoy in China, the Reaper 17 sect of the Skren attacked without warning. A mothership was sighted as part of the attacking force, but any other details regarding this encounter are unclear, due to Legion's mission being disrupted by Kane's abbess, Alexa Kovacs, who infected the AI with a virus to prevent it from connecting to the Tacitus. During the Battle of Ground Zero, GDI forces were tasked with destroying the Control Node, a vital structure of the Skrin that was responsible for channeling Tiberium radiation to all their forces on Earth. A mothership was called in to destroy the GDI and Nod bases that were attempting to destroy the node. The exact details of how they dealt with the mothership are unclear. Some suggest that the GDI commander countered the ship head-on, and destroyed it before it could wipe out his base. However, other details suggest that the commander was able to divert the mothership's attention to attacking the Nod base instead. The GDI commander may have achieved this by destroying two disruption towers that were cloaking the base. Once the mothership was made aware of the exact location of the now-revealed Nod base, it adjusted course to destroy it first, perhaps thinking the Nod base was a greater threat. This bought the GDI commander valuable time to set up anti-air defenses and send Firehawks against the mothership, destroying it after the ship had inflicted damage to the Nod base. Or perhaps the Brotherhood of Nod were able to destroy the mothership themselves. As I said, the exact details are unclear. All we know for certain was that the mothership was destroyed, after which the control node was taken out by GDI, effectively bringing the entire Skrin invasion to an end. It was only after the Skrin were defeated that the humans of Earth realized this assumed military invasion force was largely a civilian fleet, one that was originally focused on harvesting and transporting Tiberium off Earth by way of the Threshold Towers. Only one of these towers, Threshold 19, survived the Third Tiberium War. Indestructible, but also inactive, at least for now. 
Should the Skren Overlord proceed with his self-proclaimed second invasion of Earth, it's safe to say that such an invasion would bring about the most formidable of the Skren arsenal, including old and new aircraft, in order to establish air superiority over the future battlefields of planet Earth.